then limiting radically the functions uh, of government, and then trying to work out all of the nitty-gritty aspects of these things. You know, do you have if you don't want to pay for a police force, what happens if you get police service? Can can the police just deny you services if somebody's assaulting you in the street? If they do provide services, then you haven't signed up for them. Who do you owe money to? Th all that kind of nitty-gritty stuff that was very intricate and difficult to work out, they never had an opportunity to try to work it out. But this was, this was what was floating around uh, in, in their minds. Um, and so this, this is the, the, the basic premise of the book, is trying to make sense of these projects at exit by people who more or less identified as libertarians. Most of them... Uh, were very big fans of Ayn Rand's writing. Uh, there's the usual suspects here. They were reading Ayn Rand. They were reading uh, Hayek, Friedrich Hayek. They were reading Milton Friedman, uh, and they were reading um, Ludwig von Mises. Having said that, um, they were much more closely wedded to Ayn Rand's writing than to the others. And I think part of that might have been the sort of pop flavor of Rand, the novelistic flair, uh, and things like this, but I think it's also that she had a very sort of flat approach to these questions, right? And so the kind of, some of the nuance that you get in Hayek and Friedman, uh, you don't see in, in these projects in, in particular. Um, so a lot of the book is about, uses Oliver as a way to kind of think through some of these projects, and I'll talk about his project for just a second in a minute, but I just wanted to, to mention that the latter part of the book uh, is about two contemporary projects that are happening now. Um, and I was interested, in, I'm a historian, so I was <laughs> interested in the more historical components here, um, but I was also interested in, in doing a lot of the work on Oliver and these earlier projects because the contemporary projects are composed of or made up of by individuals who sort of see themselves as you know, genius creators who just come up with new things out of the ether um, you know, the myth of in your garage creating the computer and this kind of stuff, the Steve Jobs myth. Um, and so the, what I wanted to do was show that there's a long history to these things. And you could certainly go back prior to World War II. You could go back to colonization, private colonization of parts of Africa in the 19th century. You could go to look at Wakefield's experiments in New Zealand. You could look at company states. And you could go back a long way in time to find various forms of the kinds of things that I look at. But the two contemporary projects I look at, one is Seasteading, which is this Peter Thiel financed, Patrick Friedman, who's Milton Friedman's grandson, is the director, or was the director of the Seasteading Institute. This was set up in 2008 and was a project that was intended to create private floating uh, cities on the high seas. There's a lot of, I mean, I go into detail about this. There's a lot of questions here about what counts as the high seas, what's its legal status. It's not as clear as they seem to make it out to be. There's labor costs, there's engineering issues, and so forth. And so this is a project that is kind of ongoing, but has kind of gotten, had, had to rein in its most extreme aspirations, which is pretty par for the course. M most of these have big, big aspirations, and then by the time you get to what they ultimately produce, it's usually some kind of timeshare gated community, uh, like in Rome. Um, and then uh, the other project I look at is Free Private Cities in Honduras. And these are ongoing today, uh, especially on the island of Roatan uh, in the Atlantic. And I can talk a little bit more about that uh, later if people are interested. It's kind of connected to the charter cities idea, um, but it's not charter cities. It's a, it's a sort of uh, uh, steroidal version uh, of charter cities and a more exclusionary version of charter cities. But this is also something that's being driven uh, by a kind of libertarian politics coming mostly out of Silicon Valley. Um, and also coming out of the uh, universe of former Reagan officials who cut their teeth, uh, basically promoting uh, genocidal warfare in Central America in, in the 1980s. Um, I'll just say a couple things about the, the projects that, that Michael Oliver uh, generated to give you a sense or you know, sort of flavor of what he did. In 1968, he wrote a book called A New Constitution for a New Country. It was self-published. It was published in February of 1968 by a small press in Reno uh, that, that he contracted to print for him. Uh, it sold out very quickly, uh, and in May of 1968, which is sort of ironically enough, uh, he produced a second uh, edition of the book, 
Uh, many of the individuals who bought this book and were inspired by it were, were fairly wealthy uh, people in the United States already. So I talk about a man named Willard Garvey, who was a, um, a wheat magnate from Wichita Falls, Kansas, also owned a, a company called World Homes Incorporated that was building uh, low-income housing in various places around the world, including Peru. Uh, Garvey had sort of picked up on some of the ideas of Turner on sort of self-aided uh, housing, right, Ta taking certain what were essentially kind of anarchist principles and sort of repurposing them, a little bit like, um, well, I won't go into detail, but the Hernando de Soto and other libertarian think tank promoters have sort of adopted different kinds of anarchist ideas from Colin Ward and others and sort of reworked them uh, uh, in, into sort of free market um, fundamentalist uh, positions. Uh, Garvey, there's a number of other investors and others who purchased Oliver's book and they funded him, they financed him uh, to the tune of multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so Oliver set up what was called the Ocean Life Research Foundation and the idea behind this was where, if we want to set up a new country and have this kind of experiment, where can we do it? And he went all, he went all over the place. So he, you know, he went to Guyana, he went to Curaçao, Trinidad and Tobago, elsewhere, Honduras. Um, and ultimately, he figured that they needed to try something on, on the ocean. And so they found two reefs uh, in the Pacific Southwest, south of Tonga. These are called the Minerva Reefs. Uh, they hired a dredging firm to dredge sand out of the lagoons and to pile it on top of the uh, reef. And then they began to take coral and wrap it in chicken wire and then put concrete uh, to build a sort of foundation. Um, and there was promotional items and they had a corporate uh, entity that they created called the Vanguard Corporation uh, that was basically designed to sort of oversee the purchase of shares Set, you know, to um, also promote settler projects and so on and so forth. This did not get very far. Uh, the Kingdom of Tonga, the Kingdom of Fiji, uh, other small uh, archipelagic nations in the Pacific Southwest were quite concerned about uh, this project and about what it might lead to. There, there's lots of just under the water seamounts uh, in the Pacific Southwest. And you could imagine there would be an enormous sort of ocean rush of some kind. Um, so that was, that was the early 1970s, 1971 and 1972. And, uh, and so that project sort of wilted away because of opposition by uh, the Kingdom of Tonga. And they forcefully actually asserted rights over the reef. Uh, that was not the end of the story and lots of kind of things would get worked out over the course of time. And, 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 and I'm certainly happy to elaborate on that uh, in a little bit. The second project that Oliver got involved in was in the Bahamas in the Caribbean. And, um, here, uh, he allied himself, uh, it, it's quite strange actually, but he, he allied himself with uh, mercenaries. Uh, he allied himself with individuals who had former connections with the OSS, which was the precursor to the CIA. Um, some of the people uh, that he allied himself with uh, included um, old friends of E. Howard Hunt. Right? So E. Howard Hunt uh, was in the CIA and helped overthrow Arbenz in Guatemala in 1954 and then became a Watergate plumber. Um, but the person he allied himself most closely with was a guy by the name of Mitchell Livingston Werbel III, who has this very sort of fabulous name, also a very fabulous mustache. I've got, I've got various pictures of his, of, his, of his mustache. It's quite the um, topiary. Um, Werbel uh, had been in the OSS uh, and then like quite a few people who became sort of CIA or CIA adjacent in the 50s and 60s, he became a PR man, he became a public relations ad man. Um, and this is not an uncommon story. There's a lot of these guys had been trained in psych, psych warfare, psychological forms of uh, experimentation, manipulation, intimidation, and the like. Uh, there's a whole literature on this that Al McCoy in particular has written pretty substantially about, amongst others. Um, Werbel had been a PR man and then uh, became essentially uh, what was called a munitions manipulator, an arms dealer. Um, and he began to get involved in the Dominican Republic, in Guatemala, uh, in Cuba, uh, and elsewhere in the 1960s. Uh, he's most famous for his sound suppressors, silencers. So silencers were illegal at the time, but Werbel was making silencers uh, 
uh, for a man by the name of Gordon Ingram. Uh, Ingram created what's known as the MAC-10. And the Ingram MAC-10 was considered uh, to be the deadliest machine gun pistol uh, on the market in the 1960s. It fired, I can't remember how many, uh, you know, dozens or multitudes of rounds uh, a minute. And, um, and it has a kind of notorious reputation. It appears in a lot of Hollywood movies. Uh, Max von Sydow is carrying a MAC-10 uh, in Three Days of the Condor. Um, uh, John Wayne uses a MAC-10 when he plays this cop uh, in the movie McHugh. Uh, James Caan in The Killer Elite. The Wire, if you watch The Wire, <laughs> Baltimore. Uh, they mention the MAC-10 uh, a couple of different times. Uh, so the MAC-10 is, is quite uh, notorious, and Werbel was creating silencers for the MAC-10. Um, and he and Gordon Ingram had gone into business. And, uh, and so there's a whole array of characters that get involved with Oliver, and including three sort of ex-CIA agents as well, uh, and a British lord, uh, Lord Belhaven, um, the 13th uh, Lord of Belhaven and Stenton. His name was Robert Anthony Carmichael. Um, they even had a family motto um, as well that I, that I make fun of. Uh, so they, they gathered and the idea was to essentially support, kind of foment and support a secessionist rebellion in the Bahamas. And so the northernmost islands in the Bahamas, the Bahamas were gonna become independent from the United Kingdom, uh, from, from the United Kingdom in 1973. And the government that was going to come into power was clearly going to be black. It was gonna be the government of Pindling and his political party, which was, which was basically black Bahamian. The northern islands of Abaco had been settled by white loyalists uh, during the, the American Revolution. Uh, they'd been loyal to the crown and they fled after the American Revolution, they fled to 13 colonies and they went to the other 13 colonies in the Caribbean. And, um, and a lot of them settled in Abaco, and it was a very sort of patriotic, loyal, you know, I'm sure even now the sort of queen stuff that must be going on in Abaco right now must be out of control, you know. Um, and it was very patriotic this way, and, uh, and they did not want to become part of the Bahamas. Uh, initially, they petitioned to remain part of the Bahamas, uh, to remain part of the United Kingdom, to separate from the Bahamas. United Kingdom wanted nothing to do with that. Uh, so then there was the development of a kind of secessionist movement. And Oliver and Werbel together tapped into this. Uh, and the idea again was to support secession, but to support secession with the idea that these two islands that belong to this Abaco section of the, the Bahamas would become a kind of uh, private, free private state. Uh, this wasn't unknown in the Bahamas in some sense because you already had Freeport on Grand Bahama where uh, Al Capone's accountant, L Meyer Lansky, had set up um, a kind of, um, assen essentially a kind of casino special economic zone right, um, right nearby. So uh, that project also faltered. It faltered for a number of reasons. I, I won't go into a lot of detail, but the FBI were sort of tracking uh, Oliver and Werbel. I have a lot of documents from the FBI through Freedom of Information Act that sort of gives me a lot of the um, view of this from the perspective of, of the state. Uh, and Werbel was in a lot of trouble. Uh, he'd been doing all different kinds of nefarious things and had been called before Congress repeatedly. Werbel is, a, is an incredible character. I mean, if you Google him, he shows up everywhere, including the JFK assassination files. There are people who claim uh, that, that Werbel was actually in Dallas the day of the assassin. I mean, you know, you can go down some very weird uh, rabbit holes. Uh, and it's not helped by the fact that no matter what Werbel did and no, ma no matter how sort of notoriously illegal his activities, he was never really prosecuted. Um, and so that, you know, you sort of can't help but start to feel a little conspiratorial about things. Uh, his life was supposed to be made into a movie starring Clint Eastwood, um, and that didn't happen. And then Werbel died in, in 1983 uh, in L.A. So that's the second project. And then the third project is back in the South Pacific, and this is from 1975 to 1980, in the New Hebrides, uh, otherwise known as Vanuatu. Now it's, now it's Vanuatu. It became Vanuatu in 1980. It had been jointly colonized by the French and the British. Uh, in 1906, they created a sort of condominium government. The local people called it uh, pandemonium, uh, but the British and the French called it the condominium. And, uh, and uh, effectively here you have an anti-colonial movement develop in the 1960s uh, on the northernmost islands under a, a number of chiefs, 
uh, including one who's quite important by the name of Jimmy Stevens. And um, Stevens was, was really one of the important figures in, in the anti-colonial politics of the New Hebrides in the 1960s. In the 1970s, a second anti-colonial movement developed uh, in conjunction with that of Jimmy Stevens. And this was uh, an anti-colonial movement led by uh, a kind of anglophone um, church uh, intellectual class, uh, the New Hebrides National Party. Uh, and these were mostly uh, anglophone intellectuals. They were connected with, to some degree, they were connected with uh, black nationalism and black uh, international black politics. Uh, so um, Black Panthers, members of the Black Panther Party from the United States and others uh, visited Vanuatu, visited the New Hebrides in the 1970s. Uh, members of the New Hebrides National Party were, you know, they went to Tanzania, they went to the Pan-African National Congresses uh, and so forth. They were, they were a little more cosmopolitan uh, than Jimmy Stevens and his followers. They were mostly people from the bush. They were known as bush people uh, who, you know, lived lived a much more kind of uh, basic um, rural life in the Northern Islands. These two movements, kind of, they should have been natural allies and they, they more or less were until the mid 1970s. And Stevens felt that he was being marginalized. There's a lot of discussion about why Stevens did this, but the, the short of it is, is that Stevens allied himself with Michael Oliver and Michael Oliver's backers. Uh, and so Oliver had essentially gotten to know uh, the New Hebrides fairly well. He went there in 1969 and bought some land, and then he went back in 1971, uh, and then he went back in 1975. And he began to uh, organize with Jimmy Stevens for a kind of, again, for a secessionist movement as the New Hebrides was moving towards uh, independence. A lot of the material I have on Vanuatu, and it's the, probably the densest chapter in the book, uh, I went to Vanuatu in 2017 and was given access to the files of a British special branch agent uh, by the name of Gordon Haynes. Haynes had left, as decolonization was happening in Africa, a lot of the civil servants uh, in, in uh, the British civil, civil service would leave and they'd be sent to other outposts that were still colonies. Uh, and then they would, again, they would be there to sort of oversee in part the process of decolonization. Uh, Haynes got sent then from Africa to uh, the Solomon Islands and then to uh, the New Hebrides. And a big, there was one big box of his material. He died and his stuff was embargoed until 2015. And so when I got access to it in 2017, no one had seen it before and they brought it out to me. It was a big, big box, uh, just one. And the, almost everything in that box was Gordon Haynes tracking American land speculators. Almost all of them linked up with Michael Oliver or linked up with a, a real estate speculator from Hawaii by the name of Eugene Peacock uh, and a whole array of people around them. Right? Uh, and that's essentially what Haynes was doing in the 1970s. His job in Special Branch was to track American speculation. And this is the one place where the French and the British agreed. Right? They don't, French and British don't like each other, uh, but they do share a distaste for Americans and so they, they did ally with each other around um, ensuring that Americans were not able to sort of buy land, subdivide it, and so on and so forth. So Oliver uh, essentially allied himself with Jimmy Stevens and helped foment the secessionist rebellion, and there actually was a rebellion in 1980 called the Santa Rebellion. It ended in violence, it ended in displacement, uh, significant displacement, it ended in a kind of delay in the transfer uh, of power from colonial rule to post-colonial rule. Uh, it had pretty serious uh, consequences, right? And at this point, Oliver sort of kind of exits the scene, but doesn't quite exit the scene. He makes a comeback in the 1990s briefly, um, uh, again in Vanuatu, where even to this day, his name is widely, widely recognized and either revered or reviled. Uh, but he's very well known, uh, and his name is still, you know, resonant. Um, I don't know if I should go on more or stop for a while. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I, want, I wanted to, um, I, I, this is all great. <laughs> this is all great. Um, but yeah, I want to uh, talk, touch on another facet for a second yeah. um, or maybe see how it lines up with this, uh, this narrative. Um, you know, as I, as I mentioned before, there are 
certainly aspects of this idea that have resonance among those of us on the political left, or at least people with a, some nascent understanding of uh, state do bad thing, you know, like police bad, you know, and stuff I agree with. Uh, I'd like to be away from them as much as possible. Um, but while there are sort of uh, rhetorical and maybe even some conceptual similarities uh, with, uh, say, uh, the communalist movement or the uh, w w um, intentional communities, um, one thing where I, I could at least see that they differ is a lot of those, even if they aspire to get away from capitalism or some sort of like pre-capitalist mode or something, still tended to conceptualize all the participants as equals of some sort, as co-workers, as comrades maybe. Um, whereas this particular notion of getting away from the state, let me go back a second. The people who often engage in intentional communities of the left, their critique of the state is often that it is not democratic enough. These folks seem to almost take the state at its word, that it is indeed democratic, and that's what's bad with it. Mm -hmm. This fear of the masses. Mm -hmm. But that seems to inherently create a contradiction when you're trying to create a society where the premise is that the, uh, the basis of right is property um, and that there's a sort of like almost mutual relationship between the two. Property is the basis of rights. The most important right is property, this kind of thing. Um, it's hard to run a society where everyone is the ruler. So how did they, did they even get to that point where they had to realize this contradiction of uh, we actually have to exploit people, so we have to somehow maybe um, rhetorically, like there are different class of people and how does that line up? Like almost the same dilemma of the founders of the United States where they both were proclaiming freedom of, you know, the absolute God-given freedom of the individual with the fact that there was an entire class of non-people. Uh, so did, did they come up to this or did it even get that far? Yeah, they did come up to it in certain ways. Um, oftentimes, um, I won't say in the abstract, but, but things hadn't sort of really developed on the ground, but they these kinds of issues they ran into right out, uh, from the, from the get-go, right? So I can give you a few examples. Um, one is, is that Oliver dictates his constitution. Uh, so he wrote it, he's the monarch. Uh, and so there's already a contradiction in a sort of, in a weird way, right, in which the origin story is, he, he is sort of lord of all he, of all he sees and, and sets the parameters of, of what the community is going to be like. Um, in a strange way, I mean, it's not, that's not unusual. I mean, this is the basis of charter cities and free private cities, too, that are happening today, which is, you know, here's the contract. We developed it. You either accept the contract or you don't, but it's not about the vote. It's not about, you have no influence over the contract. You either want to live under this contract or you don't. And that was basically Oliver's kind of premise. Uh, but yes, it immediately ran into some problems. Um, one of the problems it ran into, which I don't talk about in the book, but another person who's written a little bit about Oliver um, in, in a very serious fashion, right? There's a lot of writing about Oliver that's sort of uh, dismissive or comedic uh, or something like this. Um, but a, um, a guy who works on, um, on uh, law uh, and land uh, in the Southwest Pacific, Anthony Van Fossen, interviewed somebody who told him about a moment in which there was an enormous breakup around the group who had uh, started the Minerva project, the island project, building the island, right? Uh, the first project that they did in the early 70s. And the breakup basically came because of a huge conflict around the status of drugs. Uh, and it had to do with part of, the, part of the rationale or part of the reason for the breakup is on the one hand you had um, this uh, aerospace engineer who was a, a, a good friend at the time of Oliver's from Orange County. There's a lot of Orange County folks involved in this, uh, all ex-military. Um, Bud Davis, who, you know, essentially his position was if you want to do drugs, if you want to make pornographic movies, if you want, you, you can, anything goes, right? Uh, he didn't, 
he didn't go so far as to say, you know, trafficking and other human beings and things like this, but he it basically said anything goes uh, within, you know, the, the, the realm of, of sort of trade. Did they talk about the non-aggression principle in that? Uh, no. Well, so Davis's quotes are little excerpts, so I don't know if they talk about, sort of, yeah, sort of where your right ends and where the others begins. The issue in this instance was that... Uh, a family member of Oliver's evidently, and this is according to the, the writing of Anthony Van Fossen, uh, that there was a family member of Oliver's struggling with uh, a pretty serious addiction issue, and Oliver kind of you know, took a sort of strong stance around this. Uh, but that's, it's a very basic one, but it's a very sort of direct one in which uh, immediately you run into these kinds of tensions around, um, around you know, in the radical commitment to this sort of individual freedom uh, in the process of trying to build a kind of community of people, right? Um, there's another instance where this unfolds in an interesting way as well, uh, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of revealing anecdote, but in the case of Vanuatu, in the case of the New Hebrides, at a certain point, Jimmy Stevens and Michael Oliver, um, as well as a previous director of the CIA, Colby, um, had suggested that uh, that they uh, recruit and assist in the transfer of South Vietnamese refugees to the northern islands of Vanuatu, uh, where they would work as kind of indentured servants. Uh, so the idea would be to rescue them and bring them, uh, and then they would they would have housing and food, but they would receive no wage, and they wouldn't really have any kind of uh, rights, as far as one could tell. Um, and you know this was an issue to the degree in which the the director of the of the um, of a kind of um, advocacy group for the rights of Vietnamese refugees in the United States at the time, a woman by the name I believe her name was Jackie Bong Wright, actually went to Congress and accused uh, Oliver of of trying to create a slave labor force. Right? I mean, so the labor issue. It, it's you, funny yeah. that one of the most influential texts would be a book called The Road to Serfdom. <laughs> and it sounds like they took it as a how-to <laughs> yeah, manual. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. I mean, I, you know, the, the labor question sort of, you know, folds into the question that you were asking about, uh, you know, this question about equality and hierarchy. I mean, even in the structure, I don't go in, uh, into the structure a lot of how these communities would operate, but the initial premise of these communities was you could, you could be a settler, you know, you'd buy in at a lower rate and you would agree to physically move yourself there and settle. Or you could be a shareholder. You could buy in at a higher rate, not move there, but actually have it be a sort of speculative um, investment. And that had its own hierarchy, obviously. And then the last thing I'll say is, you know, Oliver had to re um, issue a clarification. Uh, and he, he created this thing called the Capitalist Country Newsletter after his book was a big success. And in one of his newsletters, he said, you know, there's been some misunderstandings, and I need to clarify for everybody. We, you know, this is, right, this is the constitution for a new country. We want settlers. We want, uh, we want investors. But not if you're a nihilist or a communist or an anarchist. He said, so people are kind of misunderstanding. You know, so he had to clarify sort of, you know. But, I mean, this kind of trio of nihilist, anarchist, and communist. And... And part of it was you could imagine that there were people who sort of identified as anarchists who were sort of misconstruing or maybe not misconstruing what he was suggesting. Uh, and he was getting a little worried about some of the people who were writing to him wanting to participate in the project. Um, I, I didn't include it in the book because that chapter got very dense. But the Vanuatu chapter, I've got some crazy letters from people in uh, you know, various parts of North America uh, writing to Oliver with just, you know, uh, it, it's so uh, completely both politically but also sort of conceptually uh, in a different place where he wanted to be, and yet that's, what, that's how he was read, you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, speaking of that, uh, you do have some, you, uh, this is an illustrated book, by the way, that's one benefit of getting it, um, and there's some interesting uh, little ephemera and such. Uh, I, I saw this one that was, um, you know, people write, what you're, it was, I think it was from Michael Oliver, and it was said, like, fill out this form to right. let me know, you know, I'm trying to figure out who's ready to do this, um, and also you should buy at least 10 copies and give them out or sell them or whatever. Um, 
Is there more stuff like that? Like uh, these, you know, back in the day. <laughs> and in fact, actually, one of the books that uh, you mention in here, I remember as being from the world of sort of mail order uh, zaniness, uh, start your own country, uh, and uh, Loom Panic's catalog. So, um, yeah, I want to talk about maybe just some of the archival work of like, did you, how did you find some of this stuff? I'd imagine it's stored in people's attics or, you know, places like that. So, yeah, just a, a step away from talking about the content of the book for a little bit and just uh, what the, you know, how'd you do some of this research? Yeah, no, thanks for that question. Uh, I especially appreciate it because I, I, I am a little bit of an archive rat. I mean, I'm sort of my happiest when I'm, you know, sort of alone in some basement with stuff. Uh, so the pandemic has been difficult because all the archives have been closed. Um, so I did, I did a number of different things. Uh, you know, I was very committed as I got into the project. This wasn't intended to be a book project. Uh, I just got sort of sucked into a little tidbit of things and then I ended up going down this rabbit hole and sort of had a hard time stopping. And as I mentioned, you know, I, I mostly work on Latin America, not on, on the US, and I certainly don't work much on the Southwest Pacific. Um, but I wanted to take it seriously once I got into it, and I really wanted to sort of try to figure out uh, the various sort of personages involved and sort of try to develop uh, a, a rich, as rich of a portrait as I possibly could. So there's a couple of key things I did. Um, one is I, f I made a lot of Freedom of Information Act requests uh, early on to the FBI and the CIA, also to the DEA and to broadly to the Department of Justice. The only state agency that responded was uh, the FBI. And actually the FBI responded relatively quickly. Uh, and I have a lot of material on- Shout out to the FBI. What's that? Shout, shout out, out to the FBI. Shout out to the FBI, there you go. Shout out to the FBI. The CIA still hasn't, uh, you know, the, the, the CIA, it's been years and years and years. It's been seven years now I think that I've been Eight, eight years maybe, I've been waiting for some kind of response. Um, so the, the FBI uh, has a lot of, so I couldn't see their file on Oliver because he's still alive. Um, so you know, a person has to be dead and you have to be able to demonstrate this. But, the, but Mitchell Werbel uh, and then um, uh, an ally of Werbel's, a, a Georgia uh, lawyer by the name of Edwin Marger, I got his file because he was involved in the Bahamas project. And then the other person who I got a lot of material on was a journalist by the name of Andrew St. George. Uh, and I'll just say a few words about Andrew St. George because I also worked in his archive. Um, his, arch his collection is at Yale uh, in the library there in the archives. And um, Andrew St. George is a really spectacular character. I mean, he's a super interesting character. Uh, Hungarian, his, his name was Andre St. Georgi. And uh, he was in Hungary during World War II he escaped, uh, twice he escaped like the cusp of death in jail uh, uh, during the war. First he was imprisoned uh, by, um, by, uh, Soviet tr uh, by Nazi troops, then he was imprisoned by Soviet troops. He, was, he got out both times uh, through various interesting ways. And he became initially a kind of translator interrogator for, for the US. He was transferred to Vienna. Then he came to the United States uh, and he uh, went to night school at Columbia and was working on a journalism degree and began uh, a kind of journalistic career. This career sort of took off. In 1958, for a little magazine called Coronet Magazine, he went to Cuba, and along with Herb Matthews, he was one of two reporters to basically spend a big chunk of time with Fidel Castro and Che Guevara in the Sierra Maestra before they uh, arrived in Havana and deposed uh, Batista. Uh, St. George actually became close friends with Che. He was one of the people who was given access to Che's body when he was killed in Bolivia. Um, there, I have a photograph in there of, of Andrew St. George and Fidel Castro talking together. And uh, uh, Andrew's son, Andrew St. George's son, um, told me he's absolutely positive Che Guevara took the picture because uh, his dad had told him how Che was always borrowing his camera because he had a fascination with cameras. Yeah, so there's the two pictures there. The, there's a huge amount in Andrew St. George's archive. It's quite spectacular, including, I mean, the photographic collection is out of this world. It's really extraordinary. He became, he became an, an opponent of the revolution after, uh, after the revolution. He very quickly didn't like the direction uh, that Castro was going. Uh, 
Castro then imprisoned him. Uh, so he was imprisoned a third time in Havana, and a sympathetic guard at the prison basically let him out, and he escaped under cover of night. And then he began covering uh, the anti-Castro movement in the south of Florida. And this is how he got to know Mitchell Werbel, right? So, so Andrew St. George became sort of, I don't want to say friends, but, uh, but they had this kind of uh, uh, codependent relationship. I mean, Andrew St. George was writing a lot about Werbel. Werbel was getting a lot of attention from the journalism of, of, of St. George. So that's the, you know, so I had the FBI archives. I had the um, uh, collection of Andrew St. George, which is just truly uh, magnificent and super disorganized, but, but oftentimes disorganized archives are the best because there's just, if, you're, if you have the patience to just kind of work through it, there's so much uh, stuff that's, that's surprising to find. Um, and then I, you know, the Gordon Haynes files in Vanuatu uh, were kind of third uh, batch of documents that were super clarifying for me. Uh, there's been a lot written on the Santo Rebellion. A lot of the people who were, who were there during the Santo Rebellion are still alive. Diplomats, members of the British Civil Service, uh, Peace Corps volunteers who were living there at the time, uh, uh, you know, Nivanuatu themselves uh, and their family members uh, and so forth. Um, but the collection of Gordon Haynes is, is really quite uh, amazing and especially because he just was, was tracking uh, all of these people, right? So it's a kind of surveillance archive. He has transcripts of his interviews uh, with, with people, um, and it gives you a real sense of sort of who, who people are, who's arriving there, who, what kind of subdivisions they're engaged in. Uh, a lot of the sort of crooked politics that are kind of going on behind the scenes, which are really interesting as well. Uh, I mean, some of these experiments are really, you know, come from a place of kind of you know, serious moral purpose, even if you disagree with them. Uh, I think that's Oliver's, you know, he's, he's, he calls it a moral experiment. Others are just grift, you know, they're just another, another sort of uh, uh, Ponzi scheme or scam of some kind. Um, and then the last, the last archive I did a lot of work in was the uh, British National Archives uh, in the UK, just simply because there's, you know, the, the role of, uh, of British uh, colonial rule is so prominent in the places that I look at. I mean, Tonga was a, a British protectorate. It wasn't colonized formally by the British, but it was a British protectorate until uh, the middle of the 20th century. Uh, you know, they had colonized uh, the New Hebrides along with the French, and then, uh, and then also, of course, the, the Bahamas. Uh, and so the archives in, uh, in Kew were things that I wanted to, to work through uh, as well. I didn't do a lot of work in French uh, archives at all in the overseas archives. I didn't have a familiarity with them. Uh, I did find quite a bit of really good um, uh, uh, monthly reports coming from the French. Uh, the French burnt a lot of the archives when they fled the New Hebrides. Um, and a, a man by the name of Howard Von Trees, who's a, um, uh, a writer and, uh, and was in uh, in New, New Hebrides in the 1970s in the Peace Corps and was there for the, the rebellion, he actually rescued, along with a couple of other people, an archivist there, and Nalpa and others, my understanding is he rescued uh, and salvaged a lot of the French documentation that was going to be destroyed. Uh, and so that's actually still uh, in the archives in Vanuatu. And so that material I worked through as well. That's a lot of the material I went through. I mean, I think I mentioned I spoke with Michael Oliver a couple of times on the phone, but I didn't do any formal oral interviews for this. Um, I'm not someone who's trained in oral interviewing and, and in oral history, uh, and I think there's a kind of politics and a, and a sort of method and, a, and there's an ethics to it uh, that I'm not versed in and I didn't feel comfortable with trying to do a crash course in it. And I also felt like my conversations with Michael Oliver were very unexpected. Um, Oliver is, I mean, within these sort of, you know, this Erwin Strauss, uh, you know, create your own country, how to start your own country universe, Oliver is legendary, uh, absolutely legendary, even though he has, he's filled with regrets in some ways about these things, but he's very legendary. Um, and I was trying to find him for probably six years. And then through sheer happenstance, I sort of backtracked into a phone number, called it and left a message. I didn't expect anything to come from it. I mean, I literally had people sending me emails saying, I heard he was in the Isle of Wight, you know. Uh, that's a Google, Google, no, no, I can't find him. And then by sheer 
you know, happenstance, super serendipitous, uh, I called this number, left a message, uh, and about 20 minutes later, he called me back. I was sitting down to dinner with my family, and he called me back, and I was like, I gotta go, I gotta take this. Um, and we had these long conversations twice, um, you know, and he didn't really want to talk about these projects. Um, he, you know, he felt that they didn't get to anything, he lost a lot of money in them, you know, he was broke by the 1980s. Uh, they didn't accomplish anything. Um, someone asked me the other night when I was talking about the book if he expressed a sense of shame. And I, you know, I didn't, it wasn't shame, it was a kind of, it, there was more a sense of regret and frustration. I, I think a, a sense of being misunderstood, uh, a sense that, you know, what he aspired to really had possibilities and it just didn't, you know, people just didn't understand it, it didn't come to fruition. Um, so, you know, it was interesting to kind of talk to him and I spoke with, you know, I spoke with people in a lot of the other places where I was doing work as well, but I didn't want to do formal oral interviews. So, yeah. Anyway. Um, I want to open it up to the audience if they have any questions. Uh, I'll put my mask on, but I'll bring the mic out. Uh, it won't be videotaped, but it'll help for the streaming uh, to use the mic. Um, so, if anybody has a question and wants to raise their hand now, I can start to head your way as I put this on. Okay. Hope this reaches. Maybe a uh, step up. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, thank you for uh, coming to uh, speak with us and uh, for writing this book. Um, the question I had was, you know, this is clearly, you've you know, shown this is a, um, an intellectual current that has uh, a, a history, and I think, you know, is still very live today, whether it's with these sort of space billionaires, sort of special economic zones, you know, even, you know, stuff like, you know, Hong Kong, Singapore, sort of city-states, and this kind of desire to, um, you know, sort of, you know, in Steve Bannon's that like deconstruct the administrative state, create a patchwork as a way to, um, you know, unleash markets. And I know historians hate to uh, make predictions, but, um, and I'll try to be brief, uh, you know, there's a way in which this type of, you know, adventure capitalism can be seen as a kind of telos of the um, sort of high era of neoliberalism, you know, maybe going up to 2008. I'm just curious, in this moment when sort of industrial policy is on so many people's lips, there's kind of a, you know, economic nationalism, reshoring, whatever, in the sort of post, or whatever, post-pandemic era we're in now, how do you think people who are, you know, in this world and, and following this current, how do you think that will mesh or not with a sort of more sort of resurgent, the visible hand of the state maybe sort of coming back in these, in these ways? I'm curious if you have any opinion on that. <laughs> thanks. Sure, thanks for the thanks. question. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure I'm well situated to answer it, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a very sophisticated way. Uh, the one thing I would say is the recent, um, the recent, you know, quote unquote, appointment or election of trust in the UK, I think is a pretty interesting counter, right? I mean, the, the, her and her cabinet are embedded in, in this, uh, this is the sort of universe they come out of. They they've um, they're already talking about special like 13 or something special economic zones around the country, including you know I grew up in Felixstowe, England. My mother's English, and they're talking about Felixstowe becoming one of these zones and so forth. They're not exactly charter cities, right? But 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 they are. There is a kind of very strong libertarian esque language and has been for quite some time in Truss's rhetoric and the, the people populating her cabinet, inclu including Jacob Rees-Mogg, uh, whose father was you know, the co-author of this 1997 book, The Sovereign Individual, that has proven to be super influential on the Silicon Valley uh, tech utopians, Teal in particular, but, but many others as well. Um, that, I mean, that kind of linkage is the one that, I, you know, when I think about the sort of contemporary moment, that's what I often come back to, that there's just this interweaving, you know, I haven't gotten into talking much about cryptocurrency and, and I don't know a huge amount about it, uh, but it's fundamentally part and parcel of a lot of this. I mean, Bannon was the, you know, he was the sort of advisor or something to um, 
a company that a gaming company, right? That was put together by this guy Brock Pierce. Um, if you don't know the story, I mean, the story reveals the kind these kinds of weird connections. So, Brock Pierce was a child movie star. He was like he was in the the Mighty Ducks, that Disney movie, right? So, as a child, so you know he was this child star, and then something happened. He got a little older, and uh, some things didn't go too well. Typical child star story, I guess. And, um, but then he, he was an early investor in Bitcoin. He made a lot of money and he, the way he started a company and I, you know, I don't game, I don't do video gaming, so I don't understand exactly how it works. But my understanding is that he had a gaming company in which, um, low, super low wage workers in China would, would game and in order to achieve level ups for characters that then could be purchased by gamers at a, at a, highly elevated price uh, in the United States or elsewhere. Uh, and that this was the nature of his, his company and how he made uh, a lot of money. And that's the company that he appointed, he eventually appointed Bannon to kind of be the, the, the director of. Pierce then shows up in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria uh, at when Bitcoin was at its height in terms of value. Uh, really starting to explode in value. And he showed up uh, along with a kind of group of Bitcoin bros promising essentially sort of, you know, crypto magic. Uh, and I think at one point they made an offer uh, to, to buy or manage the electrical grid or something in Puerto Rico. And roll, I mean, to the degree that Rolling Stone did a whole cover story on Brock Pierce about this, right? They followed him around in Puerto Rico and his negotiations with the governor uh, and stuff. Um, that same year, Pierce was at this uh, Startup Societies Foundation uh, organization. So there's a, a foundation called the Startup Societies Foundation, which is attempting to kind of promote a lot of these kinds of um, a lot of these kinds of projects. Right? It's a sort of umbrella organization, and they have a conference that they do a couple times a year. And I went to one of them in 2017 in San Francisco, and Pierce was there. And so there's a whole sort of you know, it's a it's a kind of small universe. Right, but with enormous kind of um, uh, linkages and networks and connections and 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 I don't want to say relationships, but but there's a there's a there's a kind of world there uh, at some level, and and once you start kind of following these threads along, it's it's you know it's not causative or maybe it's correlational or whatever you want to call it, but it's but it's you know it, it's real that there's this kind of world out there. Um, and that, to me, I mean, the project in Honduras now, for example, I mean, there's places where, uh, you know, the state has always been incredibly, um, uh, at, at one level, weak, right? Uh, and so the, the premise behind Charter Cities was to, was in theory, to find a different model of aid, of development aid that would work, right, rather than the sort of development aid projects that are so problematic. And, and the premise was to build something like Hong Kong the nostalgic vision of Hong Kong, right? Uh, but that's very quickly now become the sort of, you know, instead of opt-in, opt-out, it's become gated, private, exclusionary. Uh, and it's not clear if it's gonna go forward anymore because of the, what happened in the election in Honduras in November this past year. Uh, but for more than a decade, these things looked like they were definitely on the horizon. And I wouldn't be too quick to kind of um, dismiss them. So I think, you know, your question's a good one. Uh, but I'm, I'm thinking on the other side of the equation. I'm looking at some place like the, the UK and Truss and, and seeing, you know, the Brexiteers, you know, sort of, um, you know, closing in on the horizon, right, that they were looking at. And there's a number of people who were very fundamental to Brexit who are also, you know, deeply involved in the Honduras projects, uh, as well, right? So you have a kind of international class of, of, um, ideologues and investors right, working together, right? There's legal experts drawing up law. They've got algorithms and that, you know, they've got all kinds of sort of code they're writing to actually create law for these kinds of places. Smart contract, Smart contract. Uh, uh, Tom Bell is the guy doing a lot of this work at Chapman University. He's, he's you know, he's working in, Hun he wrote a book called um, Your, um, Your Next, I think it's called Your Next Nation or Your Next State or something like this. Where he, where he, you know, very sort of folksy kind of tone, uh, but it's about the sort of legal process of the things that he's involved in in Honduras and the seasteaders and elsewhere, writing, writing law 
uh, that's kind of maybe a mix of common and civil law and is sort of you know, going to be adopted and adjusted in different kinds of ways. The last, the last thing I'll mention is um, Balaji uh, Srinivasan, who's a Silicon Valley uh, entrepreneur, um, intellectual, uh, and the like, just, just wrote a book called The Network State. And his operating premise uh, is that you start with the cloud and then you move to territory rather than the other way around. And so one example of this would be you have these cloud communities that kind of begin to form communities of affinity, whatever you want to call them, like-minded individuals. And as they develop a kind of digital relationship, friendship, so on and so forth, uh, they collectively begin to think about what they as a community would like to see in terms of where they could possibly settle, identify locations, identify a territory, um, and settle there, bring their wealth with them, and then use their wealth and their collective kind of power to extract concessions from the host uh, state in some form, right? So it's kind of um, using the sort of digital to get back to the analog, right? Thinking of territory as analog. Um, and uh, anyway, I mean, it, it's, uh, I could talk a, a lot about it because it just came out and, um, but there's this, you know, there's all these kinds of projects and um, to me, the, the space stuff, you know, Bezos and all of that, I mean, it's just a distraction. They're vanity projects. No one's going to be living on Mars anytime soon. I, mean, I just, you know, it takes a lot of people on the planet to keep one person alive in space. I mean, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but these other things, you know, they're a little more mundane, uh, but they're much, much more realizable uh, and, uh, and, and, and super worrisome, uh, in my opinion. Yeah. Thanks for the question. I uh, have time for one, maybe two questions. Do we have two questions? Do we have one question going one? No, does anyone else have a question? Okay. I have sort of a two-part question. Um, I was wondering, you were um, talking about Oliver and his, that he, he felt like the the actual manifestations of his, his ideas or, or the, the projects that did occur were he didn't, he, he thought that they were, um, he was critical of them. So I'm sort of wondering what, what the differences between what happened and what he envisioned, if, um, like what were his ideas? Because something that seems like, like it, it seems like with a lot of these projects, the um, transform transformational power is huge, but then the imagination is always a sort of like mundane bourgeois imagination where it's like, the more beautiful people we can get on the beach is like the highest goal of our utopia. Um, and so I'm wondering what Oliver's, uh, like what the outcome of Oliver's yeah. project would be. And then the second part is, um, um, I can't remember it. If it comes back to me, <laughs> I'll ask yeah, it. That's, yeah, if it comes back to you, that'd be, yeah. Um, Oliver's vision was not, you know, Anarchopulco, like the one in the HBO Max show, right? The anarchists, um, which, which is, you know, um, obviously something totally different. Um, the, the thing I think with Oliver, uh, it, the, I don't, you know, it's hard because I don't want to speak for him, but my sense of his regrets uh, or my sense of his frustration about uh, the the projects not coming to fruition um, is, you know, that he wanted to uh, essentially have, in some form, what is what might be called a kind of micronation, right? Uh, nowadays, right? Uh, some kind of territorial space where he could institute uh, this constitution, where he, he could actually see like-minded individuals. I mean, he he felt. My impression is, is he felt like there were a lot of people around him who thought like he did. Um, and the evidence seems to back that up. I mean, there's a, a wonderful set of interviews of, um, of uh, sort of, you know, practicing libertarians in Orange County in the 1960s and the 1970s. There's enormous enthusiasm for this kind of thing, right? Um, and, and people are talking about it, and there's, there's all this zine culture. You know, one of the things I write about is how the 1960s was not, you know, was not just the moment of the new left, but it was also the moment of libertarianism. I mean, a huge explosion of libertarian stuff 
Um, and so Innovator Magazine, which was a very important magazine based out of Los Angeles, uh, had tons and tons of this kind of stuff in its pages. Uh, its uh, personal ads were filled with ads about uh, setting up different kinds of exit societies, exit communities, and so forth. Um, someone who wrote for uh, Innovator, uh, he called himself um, El Rey, but R-A-Y instead of R-E-Y, uh, actually sort of uh, priced it out, you know, gave you sort of pricing options of different, so ur urban with, you know, urban retreat versus C-Mobile nomad versus, you know, and L. Ron Hubbard was a C-Mobile nomad. And, you know, so th it was really prominent stuff. And I think Oliver, you know, expected and thought uh, that, that these were things that could be achieved and, and would have backing, and they did. He had a lot of people invest money in his Ocean Life Research Foundation. He really had the funds. It was $10,000 a day for that dredging vessel to dredge uh, sand out of the lagoon and pile it on the reef. He had the funds to cover it, clearly. And, and um, so I think you know the frustration, in part, was the, the initial lack of success. He then had to defend himself. Uh, and so he was writing letters to Reason Magazine, for example, right? This sort of, you know, the, probably the most important libertarian magazine of the era. Um, he, was, he was writing letters to Reason Magazine to defend himself. Uh, he was, um, you know, giving interviews. He gave an interview with People Magazine in 1980 about his, his role in Vanuatu. Um, and so I think he felt like there was enormous possibility here that just never came to fruition. He didn't, you know, the one thing, the other thing I'll say here is that um, if, you know, it took him a long time, I think, in some sense, right, to sort of abandon these projects. So he stopped in 1980, but then he went back to Vanuatu in the 1990s, uh, and he did try an, briefly to do something again. He allied himself with, or he worked with a guy named Stefan Mandel, Mandel was a Romanian economist and mathematician, and his claim to fame was in 1997, he figured out how to game the Virginia lottery system. And so what he did is he got a bunch of people to lend him money, he raised multi-millions of dollars, and he bought every possible algorithmic possibility of numbers in the Virginia lottery, and he, he said it, he, he stated it up front, I know I'm gonna win one first prize, this number, second prize, third, and he won, I don't know, $27 million or something. And then got in a lot of trouble because he didn't pay his investors back. He took a he took a sort of you know uh, algorithmic fee or something, uh, and he got himself in some trouble. The Virginia lottery system changed its structure, um, and uh, and eventually Mandel went off to Vanuatu, and so Oliver and Mandel in, got together in the early 2000s and tried again to set up a kind of special economic zone on the island of Santo. Um, and again, they were, you know, sort of doing very similar kinds of things to the things that, that, that Oliver had been doing in the 1970s. So he clearly, you know, it wasn't like 1980 came and he just um, sort of, you know, ceased and desisted. Uh, he, he, he gave it, right, shots uh, again uh, a couple of times. Uh, an Atlantis project in the Caribbean very, very briefly in the 1990s. A lot of the projects are called Atlantis, it's the sort of, I mentioned that in the 1960s, instead of the age of Aquarius, we should call it the age of Atlantis because there's just an Atlantis everywhere and it's all libertarian, right? Lester Hemingway, Ernest Hemingway's brother, tried to build new Atlantis off the coast of Jamaica. Uh, Stiefel's project, the pharmaceutical engineer I mentioned, his was called Atlantis. I mean, it's, you know, it's a lot of Atlantis. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, well, I wanna thank, uh, thank Raymond Craig. Uh, everyone can help me thank him. Um, We've got the books for sale. He'll definitely sign them. You can definitely continue to chat for a little bit. Any of the books that are on display there are for sale. We do hope we can open our doors fully as soon as possible. So please stay tuned. Also, upcoming events. So please check them out. We've got a nice display of all the upcoming event authors. So, and thank you all for coming out tonight on a Tuesday night. So thanks, everyone.